Please direct all questions to the Q&A so they are not missed. I'd also like to share Mac's expectations of conduct during this session. By participating in the session, you agree to engage respectfully with the presenter and other session participants. Any type of harassing or disruptive behavior is prohibited, including, but not limited to, abusive or derogatory comments, slurs or epithets, threats or acts of violence, intimidation, misgendering, or excessive comments not pertinent to the topic at hand. We'll be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar, and if anyone engages in harassing or disruptive behavior, that person will be removed. Thank you for following these guidelines. Finally, you are welcome and encouraged to share your conference experience via social media. I'll be adding to the chat suggested conference hashtags. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to our presenters. Hello all, thanks for joining. Um, we're just gonna do a quick introduction for each one of the panelists and then get into our, um, our each of our, uh, our presentation. So um, give me one second here. And so uh, I'm Greg Bailey. I am the university archivist at um, Iowa State University. I have been here for a little over a year and a half now. Um, prior to that, I was the university archivist at Texas A&M for five years. And my first job out of grad school was at Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas. Um, I received my bachelor's of arts degree from Eastern Illinois with history major in political science and geography minors. And I have a master's of library science from Indiana University Bloomington with specialization in archives and records management. I have had the honor to serve uh, on Society of American Archivists uh, universe, College and University, university Archives Steering Committee, um, as well as the SAA uh, Mentoring uh, Committee, Subcommittee, and um, I'm currently serving on the Project Stands Orientation Committee along with Katie. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Jessica to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jessica Ballard. I'm the Archivist of Multicultural Collections and Services at the University of Illinois at the Champaign-Urbana campus. Um, I also did my master's at IU Bloomington. I did a joint master's in history and library science, and I'm currently serving on the advisory board for Project Stand. Am I next? Hi everyone, I'm Julie Braun. I'm the Curator of Modern Literature and Manuscripts at The Ohio State University Libraries. Um, and in that position, I oversee the modern literature holdings and provide special collections based instructions. My research interests include women publishers and booksellers, zines and self publishing, and I'll pass it along to Katie. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Katie Nash and I'm the University Archivist and Head of UW Archives at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I received my master's in library science from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, I'm also a certified archivist and I serve on a few different SAA committees as well as the orientation committee for Project Stand. Alrighty, with that, uh, I guess I'll just kick us off with the presentation. So, um, so I've mentioned before, uh, I'm here at Iowa State University. Um, and we had a number of projects, uh, you know, kind of dealing with COVID. So um, as many of you may have read in our uh, synopsis for uh, the this session here, the idea of, you know, kind of came back around with the fact that in 1918, 1919, the United States saw a major pandemic hit with um, uh, the flu, uh, colloquially called the Spanish flu. Um, but uh, so this image here was uh, from on campus in one of the gymnasiums with, uh, with the nurses working to um, try to work with the Student Army Training Corps on campus during that time. Um, we felt in the archives here at ISU that it was our duty to work to collect materials, um, experiences and things like that from students at ISU, faculty, staff, and even uh, the general population around uh, Ames in the state of Iowa so that when researchers come back to look at um, this time, uh, they will have those source materials like they did what we have in our archives covering um, the 1918 epidemic. So the very first um, aspect that we kind of came up with was a project that I specifically oversaw um, was 
when we started uh, moving students off campus uh, after spring break, they said no students were going to come back after spring break to um, to do classes. That everything was going to go online for the rest of the semester, and we felt that uh, there's a number of students who probably needed to continue some kind of work for um, for their being able to pay for education and whatnot and see if they were living in Ames itself. So um, with them not being able to work on campus either, after everyone got moved off March 17th from the universities when they shut down the campus completely for us here, um, we came up with this idea of working with student workers in the library that gave them an opportunity to continue to make some money um, if they volunteered and decided to share their experiences with COVID. So the first idea was um, giving them an opportunity here to share it either uh, via blog, which can, you kind of kind of see on the left hand side, they would write up a uh, summation for like a week of their experience. Um, they would submit it to me and I would put it on our ISU blog. And if they wanted to submit photographs, uh, it was always nice as well to have that kind of um, support them. Another outlet that we allowed them to do was um, if they wanted to record like a video story or thing like that. So um, a vlog actually, um, we allowed the students to do that. And um, that's what you can kind of see in the, the, the image on the right that uh, students submitted any number of uh, amount of time on um, recording their experiences for the past week, how they were dealing with things, stress, uh, what they might've been doing, um, what they were thinking, of, um, of what was going on in the world with the pandemic at the time. Um, so we had about uh, eight students, I think it was, who decided to uh, participate in this, this aspect here, which I said was completely voluntary. Um, it was a way for them to continue working with um, in the library. So we paid them basically, you know, the time kind of that they spent on creating these stories to be able to make a little bit of money in that regard. So. Um, with that, with that uh, idea that these are a little bit more of um, works for hire kind of thing is how we had classified them. Um, but we made clear that we were going to make them available online and freely accessible. So that was um, one aspect that really didn't um, have a discussion more on copyright and things like that since we were we were paying them on their time. So it was a little bit more of a work for hire kind of aspect. Um, the next aspect we launched was a very much larger one for um, across the university for folks who were students, faculty, staff outside the library, um, as well as hopefully also bringing in folks from um, Iowa and around the, um, the, uh, the state of Iowa. Um, I think this is very similar to a lot of the projects that were going on at universities in that regard that we would do, made available folks being able to submit uh, a journal if they wanted to submit journal. I think we only had one person submit a journal um, for us, uh, others were oral histories, which are kind of laid out here on the right screen that students uh, um, and staff and faculty participated in oral histories that were um, recorded via Zoom. Um, and we put them in uh, one of our online instances called Aviary. It's something fairly new we got into because it allowed us to um, provide captions and transcripts and uh, audio slash video of, of these um, of these files as well, so we would be have better accessibility for them. Um, I think the one student at the very bottom there, um, he did more of a, um, kind of just like a, a video journal, like a, 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 a typical daily life aspect. So it was a little bit um, different than an oral history that he had submitted for that regard. Um, I think we had 10 or so folks so far participate in this one. This is an area we'd like to expand a lot more in, um, in that regard, I think, um, as for us, we had we viewed some of the issues we had with it, I think, was when we first launched just, you know, in Iowa, we had dealt with the pandemic. And then when we were starting to launch this program, like in late um, summer, we had the derecho come through central Iowa and absolutely devastate, you know, through Ames, central Iowa area. And um, that was caused a lot of stress on folks as well. And there was also the social uprisings with uh, after the George Floyd, George Floyd issue. Um, and his murder and uh, the Black Lives Matter that um, we didn't have a lot of response that we thought we could have had on that. And uh, we completely understand that with also just the stress folks we're dealing with during this time. So this is an area that uh, we'd like to try to advance a little bit more on. Um, 
another project that was launched with the university that we were are participating and helping out in is the Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities. Um, we were offering many grants to faculty uh, at the university to help, um, you know, document what was going on with COVID. So to faculty from the English department uh, got a mini grant and they did uh, this project called Quarantine Journal Project, which they printed up these really neat little um, uh, personal journals that folks would um, uh, submit as part of their classwork. And um, as part of the grant that they're going, they're submitting these to the archives to have in, in full time. So folks would basically were journaling, running out their um, experiences during COVID um, as part of this project. So um, it's another different aspect that um, we are working with to help gather this material. We didn't oversee this project in the special collections, but uh, we're partnering with uh, the faculty from English to be able to bring these into uh, the archives and the plan is to digitize them as well. Um, a, another project that we had um, were partners in was the Voces of a Pandemic. Um, so the Voces Oral History Center out of the University of Austin at Texas um, had launched a program to um, try to collect voices of our and experience of, of Latinx um, students and uh, persons around the United States um, to document that uh, experience for um, for posterity purposes, since uh, as we know, a lot of times these uh, these these uh, identities are not covered in special collections and are historically have not been. Um, so we had a faculty member out of our um, Latino Studies program, actually the department head, um, was spearheading this, and we've been working with her um, to have all these oral histories that will be um, also available both through Voces and through I uh, ISU special collections to have them available. So I think. Uh, she so far has collected five of five or six of those oral histories, um, and but we've not had a chance to get them uploaded so far into um, aviary. So this is something that was transferred um, to us recently, and I got uh, from my my boss Daniel. He recently had all the files and got the um, transcription, everything taken care of on them. So it's something I'm awaiting to accession that will be available here in the near future. Um, last thing I will talk about real quickly is also. Some of the continued work that we need to be planning on doing. Um, I kind of mentioned earlier that we want to expand um, the COVID stories project that was also is trying to expand outside the university. So most of the material we have relates to uh, university students, faculty, and staff. We want to try to be able to um, cover a little bit more in the rural community because it is a aspect that Iowa State is our special collections um, concentrate on, and it's something that we're a little bit um, underrepresented right now as part of this project. And two other things that also came out of this is um, after COVID happened and they pushed all the students off campus for uh, the end of last spring and the first uh, in the fall semester this year, um, that uh, they launched a international uh, adventure learning community. Um, so essentially all the students who were international were not allowed to come obviously back on campus. So it was trying to give them an opportunity for a learning community. And we've uh, talked with uh, some of the directors of that learning community to try to connect with those students to be able to do some oral histories on them and see how um, their experiences was with um, that being international students, what it was like in their home country and how they were handling um, trying to get an education at Iowa State and prepare to come to ISU um, in person. And the other one is dealing with the Cyclone AIDS. Um, these are undergraduate students who are kind of like um, tour guides and um, help with admission at, at, through the admissions office to give folks um, that experience when they come to campus. So we were going to reach out to them as well. We've been in contact with the head of them as well, uh, their, their um, advisor as well to work with them on trying to get captured their experience since it had been a unique uh, aspect and change into um, what the work they've done in the past. So, all right, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Jessica. That was the end of my presentation and let uh, her talk about hers. Morning, everyone. So last spring, as we transitioned to a new normal of working remotely, um, my colleague, Bethany Anderson, the Natural and Applied Science Archivist, contacted me to see if I was interested in doing a collaborative COVID-19 documentation project. Um, next slide, please. 
So probably one of the more recent um, documentation projects that we had um, that one of our colleagues worked on was um, the 9-11 project that um, student life and culture archivist Ellen Swain conducted. And it was a project that allowed people to publicly, but also anonymously give their reflections. Participants were asked to be respectful, um, but it was an opportunity for people in a way to kind of come together during such a tragic, scary, and vulnerable time. Obviously, um, doing something, doing a project that was public in this way wasn't really an option for us. Um, so next slide. Um, but talking to um, Ellen was very helpful in thinking about how we could design something um, that would allow people, um, especially during this time, um, to express what their experiences were like. So we reviewed um, other COVID-19 documentation projects that had already taken place at other institutions. We spoke to our university archivists who recognized that the resources and the technology we have in the present make it much easier to do this type of documentation work, which was not much of an option during the 1918 flu. And we also consulted with the copyright, copyright librarian um, to get her advice on the best way to handle any copyright concerns. Next slide. So the goal of this project is to document the experiences of the U of I community, um, such as the transition from in-person to remote, we kept our scope to university affiliates, faculty, staff, students, and alumni. Um, since the Champaign-Urbana area has um, community or public archives, um, we wanted to do our best to make sure that we weren't doing too much to overshadow important initiatives that were taking place. And although there are lots of intersections between the university and the community, um, it is our goal to try to make sure that um, we are respecting um, especially what community and public archives are doing. So we designed um, basically a form um, where people could give us some biographical information um, and they could also submit any type of material, any type of re written reflections, oral ones, um, and the only question that we require people to answer is what their university affiliation is. Other than that, everything else is optional. And we do have a Dropbox um, where people can upload any type of material. And unless an individual indicates who they are, um, Bethany and I actually have um, are not aware of where the material is coming from. And we wanted to do that um, to make sure that if people wanted to give reflections, but they also wish to be anonymous, that um, they had that option. So I will try to put these links in the chat for the sake of time and technology, I decided not to have us fully walk through the form. Um, but basically with the submissions, um, Sorry, lost track of my notes, but as indicated, um, there's only one area that's optional. We do have some questions based on some demographic information, biographical information. We also do have an area where we ask about copyright because we wanna know if any material that is submitted um, is by the actual creators of the material as well. And we used a Creative Commons license and we also have a link to that provides a definition for that so that everyone is on the same page. So next slide, please. Um, so for the, so this is just a quick flyer um, that a student group made for us. And then types of submissions that we've received are, um, we've gotten news, we've gotten um, written reflections, digital diaries. We've also had some um, interesting types of music. We've had rap songs, alternative music. Um, and then there's also been quite a few um, individuals interested in giving us material later, um, but especially depending on the units that um, people are affiliated with. Some feel it's better to um, just acquire some things before they send anything over to us. And of course, there are some materials that also may entail a couple ethical concerns as well. Um, so next slide. 
Um, so this is just a snippet um, from an article that was written from the Illinois News Bureau um, when Bethany and I were interviewed. And there is a photo of a professor who needed to find a space in his home to do webinars. And you can see that the room is very soundproofed. And that's actually the only um, photo that we see that we have um, made accessible. We, we received permission from the professor um, but other than that, um, nothing will be accessible until Bethany and I do an extensive review process of the materials. Next slide. Um, so that's a link to the submission form. And, um, and since this is recorded, and I'll try to make sure um, anyone has access to it later if there's an interest in seeing it. And the next slide. So, um, where we are in these stages for right now, Bethany and I have kind of felt there isn't a need to um, rush too much with um, this project. We've received quite a few inquiries from multiple entities um, regarding when the materials will be um, accessible. Some have reached out because they're interested in some research. Some have wanted to write about um, the experience, but we've continued to be pretty firm just about not making the materials accessible for um, right now. And a big part of that is because we recognize that um, for us personally, while we are engaged in this work, we have also been very heavily impacted by this as well. Um, but we do feel that this will help to inform some best practices. Um, something that has, I think, been a little bit helpful is we've created an informal working group with another um, unit in the library who is also doing a similar documentation project. So we've created a draw. So we create we've created a Dropbox um, to help us with these um, to help us just gather some extra resources. And um, and to have a di and to have a further dialogue as well. And it's been helpful um, just with the few conversations that we've had to be able to have that space to kind of bounce ideas from one another. And of course, um, HIPAA is very much an area that um, we feel we need to do more um, extensive review. And another important um, aspect for us to consider is what communities may not have been represented. And because we have um, made this so that people can keep their anonymity, if that's the desire, we may never really get um, the a full idea of um, who is who are submitting materials to us. But I think it's also important not to um, disregard the fact that um, we are a community where there are more cultures um, represented more than others and that this pandemic has especially um, really affected some communities more than others as well. So next slide. Um, so some takeaways so far from this project is there have been individuals who have reached out to us that have expressed that they're happy we're doing this project. Um, they think it's very important and they recognize um, how th this material can be valuable in the future. But, they've, but some have also said they're just not ready to participate in such a project. It's a little too difficult for them right now. And we've done our best to ensure that it's never our intent to pressure anyone to participate. And it's also provided um, opportunities. I've candidly said that my both of my alma maters have done, are doing COVID-19 documentation projects. And while I would love to contribute to them, I personally am not in a place where I'm ready to do that either. And um, of course, um, when it comes to this work, um, especially while you're documenting a pandemic while you're in it, um, it can be just very challenging even to review the submissions. And that is something um, that is especially um, a big priority is making sure that um, your self-care um, is also um, considered within this. And next slide. 
Um, and so something that I'd like to see more in the future would be um, more dialogues about what it is like um, when it comes to documenting a crisis or um, trauma and how it very much has an effect, not just on those that are being documented, but also on those who are doing the documentation. So I have some selected links. If you haven't read Era Tansy's um, blog on um, no one owes um, their trauma to archivists. I highly recommend reading it. Um, I think it's even resonated with me slightly differently from when it came out last summer to even the present. Um, there's a lot of great takeaways and um, there's also some links that she provided that I have on here about um, documenting human rights and also um, trauma from both perspectives. And the next link. Um, slide. And then finally, um, this is just a link of um, some additional resources for other organizations that are doing a lot of documentation projects, some related to COVID, um, some not, but definitely um, there can be some intersections that may come with this. Um, and then final slide. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I'd also welcome any input that anyone would like to provide, and I will leave it to Jolie next. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about building the quarantine zine collection at the Ohio State University's Rare Books and Manuscripts Library. And before I get started today, I want to begin by providing just a bit of context. So next slide, please. So the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library, or RBML, is one of eight special collections units at the Ohio State University Libraries. And you can see our reading room in this image right here. So we focus on literature and cultural history from medieval manuscripts to contemporary novels. And that's a lot. So within that, we have a few different collections, collection strengths, including American literature and literary manuscripts, historic photographs, cookbooks, LGBTQ collections, and zines. Next slide, please. So before I go too much farther, I'd like to take a minute and just talk about what zines are. So a zine is a self-published magazine typically created for passion rather than profit. And I want to just go over a few common characteristics. Um, they're often inexpensively produced, so they might be photocopied and stapled, maybe even printed from your home printer. They're typically small circulation, and that could be maybe as few as 10 copies or maybe as many as a few hundred. Uh, they're also usually made by just a single person or maybe a very small group of people. And one of the really wonderful things about zines is that they can be on very niche topics that you wouldn't find elsewhere. And so the slide you're looking at right here is just a few different samples from our collections to give you a sense of sort of the variety of what they can look like and, and, and be like. Next slide, please. So there's many many great reasons to collect zines, but one of the major motivations for me is that they offer stories, experiences, and perspectives that may not be found in mainstream media. And so I really see zines as a key to building a diverse collection. Next slide, please. So having given you some background, I'd like to talk a little bit now about how and why I began the Z quarantine zine collection. And in April, 2020, it just kind of started by looking at social media and seeing this hashtag quarantine. And so you can see uh, the results of, of doing this search on Instagram and it's pulling up a lot of different examples, some that are documenting um, life in the pandemic and some are just zines that were made during that period. Next slide, please. And not long after that, I began noticing articles um, in major outlets about quarantine zine making. And these were often not just documenting the trend, but actively encouraging this. And so you can see that in the NPR article on the left, it says how to make a mini zine about your life during the pandemic. And then on the right, the Thrillist article, the rise of quarantine zines, and then again, how to make your own. Next slide, please. So, it was clear to me that zines were one of the ways that people were documenting life during the pandemic and that they could offer something beyond newspaper articles or other kinds of publications. 
And as RBML is a special collections unit, we don't typically prioritize collecting materials about current events, yet the pandemic was such a historic moment. And there were so many zines that I saw being produced about it that I felt really compelled to think about how to collect them. So the very first step was talking to the head of special collections about doing this project. Um, last spring, our funding had been frozen, so I needed to think about how we might be able to make this possible. He was willing to make available some of our unit's general use funds for the purpose. And because this was a rather unorthodox approach, um, we had to talk to the associate dean, who fortunately was enthusiastic and gave her approval for this. And I want to say that this project wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't gotten them on board. So I'm very grateful they saw the value and were willing to support it. So after I got them on board, I started thinking about uh, the collection focus. And quarantine scenes probably sounds fairly specific already, but once I began looking, it became very clear to me that even within that subject, I wanted to think about parameters. So I really tried to prioritize nonfiction. There's lots of poetry and, and short stories, but I, I really wanted to have um, you know, more, more journal and documentary sort of zines. And also photography and art zines, in part because I thought they would complement RBML's artist books and photography holdings. Next slide, please. So the next step was locating the zines. And I used a few different methods. So one was that first one I shared with you, social media, and just kind of trying to poke around and, and track down hashtags. Um, I actually was able to find a lot through looking for just doing Google searches and Google image as well. I relied on zine distros, which are vendors that sell zines from a variety of creators. And then lastly, as you can see in the slide here, I purchased many from Etsy, which lets you, as you probably know, buy directly from the creator. And I want to acknowledge that this was a really labor intensive process. It likely would not have been possible during a normal year, but because our priorities had shifted, I had more time to devote to collection development. And I also want to say just a bit about buying those zines. So for those on Etsy or I found from individuals on social media, before purchasing them, I notified the seller that I wanted to acquire their zine um, for RBML in case they wanted to decline or ask questions. Next slide, please. And so the idea behind this was really inspired by the Zine Librarian Code of Ethics. And you can see um, their website on this slide. And this is a recommended set of guidelines for acquiring zines created by a group of zine librarians. And the idea here is that zine makers typically don't anticipate their work becoming permanently preserved in an institutional collection. So it's really about being mindful and asking permission. And this seemed especially important when thinking about collecting zines about the pandemic. So I'd like to share some of the zines I've acquired and some of the major themes that emerged in, in this process. And before I get into specifics, I'll start by giving you a bit of an overview of the collection currently. So right now we have about 80 zines. They're English language, predominantly from the US, but a few other countries are represented, including Canada, England, France, Germany, Malta, Australia, New Zealand, and Hong Kong. And the creators range from in their teens to their 50s, and we have zines by veteran zine makers who have been doing this for 20 years, as well as uh, zine makers who this is their first zine. So having, having given you a little bit of that context, I'd like to now look at some of the zines within the collection. Next slide, please. So one of the major themes that emerged was people wanting to tell their personal stories of living through the pandemic. So documenting everyday life and how the pandemic has changed their life. So um, you can see a few examples here. On the far left is a zine called Quarantine. And it is a sort of acting as a newspaper with very lackluster headlines. So you can see there's a news story about the weather and then having leftovers for dinner. Um, in the middle is a zine about being jobless at home. And then on the far right, you see one called I Miss People. And so that's just about the, the difficulty of physical isolation and missing family and friends and community. And so these occupy a really interesting space. They're not private journals, but they're small scale, fairly personal and intimate experiences. Next slide, please. 
Another major theme I noticed emerging was uh, zines about mental health and self-care. And so a lot of these were offering strategies and advice focused on specific challenges that the pandemic either created or intensified and how to deal with them. So the examples we see here on the far left, how to survive the pandemic while autistic, in the middle, how to find inspiration during a pandemic, and then on the far right, how to stay sober during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So, Another theme that emerged was um, there were some, most were created by individuals, but some were created by small groups and were really um, collections of essays or interviews. So an example that you see here is called National Treasures and it's a UK zine that is a compilation of essays by national health service workers. And so it's open to a page that is an essay by a filmmaker who is working as a cleaner in, the hosp in a hospital. And so these zines are really aiming to document the collective experience through uh, many, many personal accounts. Next slide, please. And so one of the last ones I wanna share with you are the art and photography zines. And so these are really aiming to document the physical changes the zine makers see in the world. And the example you see here is Pandemic by Jordan Collins. And this is an artist in Toledo, Ohio, and it's no text, just photography. And, and I have a example of one of the images on the right, just to give you a sense of what, what kind of photography is within the scene. And I think from these examples, I hope you can get a sense of how the flexibility and the specificity of zines as a medium really, I think, lends itself to documenting a wide range of experiences and commentary about the pandemic. Next slide, please. So I want to wrap up just by talking about a few next steps for this collection. So during the past winter, my archivist colleague accessioned these zines and created a preliminary inventory. And that's what you're looking at right now, this finding aid that's available. Um, my hope is that this collection will be the raw material for a variety of really fascinating research projects. And like our other zines, I anticipate them being actively used in class sessions. And some of these zines were actually just used this past spring in a session as well. And I also wanna keep thinking about how this collection can speak to our other holdings, not just the other zines, but materials about health and illness or other significant historic events. And I'm interested in thinking about how the zine collection can maybe relate to that work that other units are doing such as University Archives or the Medical Heritage Center who both have projects about documenting COVID-19 as well. Next slide, please. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, thank you so much for listening and I'm going to hand it over now to Katie. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, and I'm really happy to be here presenting with the other panelists um, and talking about the Documenting COVID-19 Project at UW-Madison. Uh, next slide. So before I dive into some details about our project, I want to take this opportunity and thank two institutions specifically who quickly launched COVID-19 projects. Once we decided to create a project at the UW Archives, we relied heavily on the details, the structure, and overarching themes of these two institutions' projects. They included relevant and thoughtful information related to the goals and intentions of each project, privacy and health concerns, uh, donation procedures, various avenues of communication, and so much more. So the first institution is UNC Charlotte, um, and their project is called Contribute Your Stories of the COVID-19 Outbreak. And they were really one of the first institutions to pull together a comprehensive COVID-19 um, project website. The other institution is Michigan State University and their project is documenting COVID-19 experiences at Michigan State University and soon several other organizations and institutions began projects of their own. And I also really wanna sincerely thank you, thank the UW Archives team um, and our staff for their great ideas, their patience, the collaborative spirit and dedication over this past year, 
and our project certainly continues to be a team effort. Next slide. The UW, the UW Archive staff uh, spent part of March 2020 discussing options for providing a place and platform for the university community to actively participate and contribute to the historical record of this unprecedented time period. Weighing the pros and cons of starting a project similar to other institutions, we decided that the potential richness of capturing this time period was worth the effort, the struggles, and any doubt we carried. So we decided to get to work and build our Documenting COVID-19 project that was launched on April 8th, 2020. Creating this project came amidst the staff transitioning to remote work for an unknown period of time, as well as supporting our student staff and getting them set up for remote work and ensuring we could carry out research services and support to campus and beyond. So as a team, we started looking at other institutions sites and developed a bucket list of what we wanted to include in our own project and weighed those desires against individual capacity. Right away, we knew we couldn't do this alone. So we immediately started identifying partners within the libraries and on campus that could help us with everything from graphic design to website functionality to communication and promotion. So to date, our most reliable partners have been the library's communications department and university communications. One thing was certain, we wanted to create a platform and process for the university community to optionally share their stories, perspectives, reactions, and tidbits of daily life during the pandemic. With that goal in mind, we created a website with general information about the project, as well as several ways to contribute content and or a personal story. We created a Google form to collect content and appropriate metadata. And this form includes several important disclaimers related to privacy, copyright, personal health information, expectations related to access and use, and much more. In general, we are interested in collecting digital, digital journals and diary entries, emails, photographs, videos, voice memos and audio recordings, digital art, and any, any other digital documentation of how our campus community has been affected. We also developed a short questionnaire people could fill out if they needed help on how to tell their story and get started. Another big component of our project includes collecting oral histories and providing people with a variety of ways to submit audio content, whether that be leaving a voice message, submitting an audio recording, or participating in a more structured interview. So currently, the response has been more than we expected, but not overwhelming. Um, we certainly faced our fair share of challenges, and once we figured out a way to overcome some of them, it's opened the doors to a lot of opportunities. So one of our biggest challenges in developing the project was staff capacity. We're a fairly small staff for a Big Ten institution and we have a few staff vacancies. So we have to carefully prioritize our work and new initiatives. We decided to develop the project in the midst of a lot of change and transition within university archives, especially as it related to our student staff and public services. Not to mention that the pandemic was just beginning and there was a lot of uncertainty, anxiety, and stress about the future. So we weren't even sure if our project and communication about the project would get lost in the flood of information we were all absorbing and trying to make sense of. We definitely wanted to minimize challenges related to technology. So we purposely selected familiar technologies such as our WordPress website and Google Apps. Choosing these platforms allowed us to create a seamless workflow for capturing information and content that could easily be submitted, analyzed, and archived on the back end. Another challenge we still face today is the question of now what? We've received all this content and opened our doors to accept people's personal stories and their perspectives and reactions to the pandemic. So what do we do with everything now? Um, and when and how can we make this content available to the public? These questions and many others are ones that we will start addressing soon. So during the spring and early summer of 2020, we received a steady flow of submissions. However, 
Recently, there's been a pretty sharp decline in participation, so we, cont we, we continue to brainstorm ideas and seek new opportunities. There are several notable moments on campus in which the pandemic greatly affected certain groups of people. For example, in the fall, there was a large outbreak of the virus in a couple of the dorms, and there was a mass exodus of students from dorm rooms and a scramble to find temporary housing and quarantine space for them. This not only impacted the student body, but also all the healthcare workers, UW housing employees, the dining halls, and many other people on campus, as well as businesses that are located close to the dorms. As a team in UW Archives, we've discussed what it would look like to focus on this particular situation and reach out directly to students and employees that were impacted by this virus outbreak and make them aware of the project, possibly encourage submissions and bring awareness to the oral history component. But for a number of reasons, we believe it's too soon to move forward with this idea. But there are several similar examples where we can target certain populations on campus and try to capture their stories. We continue to be mindful of the variety of situations the pandemic has caused and exacerbated for individuals and communities. And we want to remain respectful and acknowledge that not everyone is ready or will ever be ready to share their experiences, especially with an intention of broader consumption. So moving forward, the project's website is still live and we continue to accept submissions. At this point, we are focusing on promoting the oral history side of the project as that is what most people seem interested in. We will continue to evaluate the various campus milestones and notable moments and discuss as a group how and why we might want to branch out and target specific audiences and better to better understand how this pandemic is affecting communities and individuals at UW-Madison. Next slide. So for the individuals who chose to share some aspect of their life and experiences, I wanna highlight a few of the submissions we've received. So to date, we've received around 82 submissions of artwork, around 230 photographs, 20 essays and journal entries, around three to five videos and other content such as maps, flyers, poetry, and other miscellaneous digital content. We've conducted around 17 oral history interviews during the first round, which is about eight hours of audio. And we've also conducted around 11 follow-up interviews and have a handful of more interviews scheduled. So the next few slides include some examples of the variety of submissions we've received. And what I've tried to include on each slide is um, an example of the item that was submitted and the, um, the, the status or the category of the person who submitted uh, this item and a brief description that was also submitted. So in this first one, you can see it um, was submitted by a graduate student in art. And they stated that water, this is an example of watercolor images loosely inspired by quarantine and the pandemic as a way to laugh through it. Next slide. So this is just one example of many um, of, this, of these types of collages that we received from um, a retired professor in clinical medicine. And they're all very, very unique and really interesting. Um, and they're called the Corona Chronicles. And as you can see from the brief description, um, they are poetic collages made with photographs and contemporary newspaper headlines. Next slide. Um, I thought this was an appropriate one from a faculty member in GIS, which is a map of um, uh, the Isthmus, which is where the, the state capital is located, and also um, where it says kind of below down to the left, where it says uh, too congested, I believe, um, is towards uh, campus. So I thought this was pretty interesting um, in terms of outlining um, what Madison is looking like to this person um, during, during the pandemic. Next slide. So we did receive a lot of digital art, um, probably more than I expected and maybe my team too. Um, but this is from a student who was in an online program um, for grief support specialist certificate program. 
And uh, this is just a brief description of um, what this artwork uh, represents. But we, again, received quite a bit more submissions from this particular um, person, but this was one that was pretty, pretty fascinating and visually very stimulating too. Next slide. So this is, we again, we received, you know, around 230 photographs. And um, this is a photograph of Library Mall on campus, which this photograph was taken in late March um, 2020. And so this is at the beginning of the pandemic and when campus um, basically closed. This particular picture is interesting because this is a part of campus that is usually super crowded. Um, and so you can see that, you know, the sidewalks and the green spaces are completely empty. So it's, it's a pretty stark image um, compared to what it is usually like uh, on campus. Next slide. So there's a lot more that I could say about our project, including the decision-making process, working with students to help us process submissions on the back end, working with partners across campus, highlighting places where our project has been featured, and the list goes on. But if you would like to chat or learn more, um, you can feel free to contact me directly, and my email is on the screen there. Um, but in the meantime, you too can stay connected with our project and the UW archives by following us on social media, um, but also exploring our project's website. And I will add um, a couple of links in the chat. So thanks for everyone's time and attention today, and um, we look forward to answering any questions anyone has. Thank you. All right, looks like we have a few questions that have come in and please submit any other questions you have to the Q&A. Uh, first, was it difficult to set aside whatever projects you had been working on and find the time to organize a COVID documenting program on top of everything else? I guess I can go. Um, yeah, so it was kind of an interesting transition for me because I was here as a visiting position and then um, I started on the tenure track, I think the week that we went to remote work. Um, but I think it was almost a shift because there were certain things that I'd planned to do that all of a sudden I couldn't do. Um, so I, I guess in, in a way, while we were trying to figure out how this would work, it was actually something else to do in the midst of it. Um, kind of also, uh, you know, echoing Jessica there is like, I had only, I started at a, uh, ISU here in November of 2019. And then, you know, five months later, they're saying you got to go work from home. So I had barely had any time on campus to try to establish, you know, start establishing those relationships with, um, departments around campus. Um, and so it was a little frustrating in that regard. Um, but then it was also then trying to come up with ideas and projects of how we're going to move forward from working from home. And also at the same time, um, knowing that this is a major historical event in, um, in the world's history. So how would we go about um, trying to do some work to collect um, how this is impacting folks at the university and around the state of Iowa? So, and it's also interesting that like, my direct supervisor, the director of special collections, he was he was here like a, a month before I was. So we had, there had been a lot of turnover in the special collections here at ISU. So um, it was one of those things that we were transitioning in a number of ways um, with new folks coming in and then how we're we gonna handle coming up with opportunities to work from home when we were all working from home, when so many of us were fairly new in the positions that we have here, so. I would just say similarly um, to Greg and Jessica's experiences, it actually worked out really well for me um, in part because usually I'm very busy with teaching and other responsibilities during the spring. And then those just kind of 
went away <laughs> and doing collection development was kind of a perfect thing to work on from home. I will just chime in quickly. Um, I would say yes, the, the transition from um, working on site to working remotely and also trying to pull together our COVID-19 project was, was pretty challenging um, because a lot of our work and our, the projects that we were involved with were very on-site focused. So we have had to completely really transition our focus and our priorities um, and that was challenging in of itself, but it was also, we had to kind of figure out, okay, what projects are our students gonna work on? Um, and so, yeah, kind of doing all of that and developing our project and uh, trying to really carefully think through um, a lot of the details was, we did it, but it was, um, yeah, there were some challenging moments for sure. Okay, for Katie, did you reach out to UW Medicine to participate in your project? If yes, what was the result? Uh, that's a really great question. And I, and I will say that when we launched the project, um, we actually did not reach out to any specific unit on campus um, because really we wanted to see if we could promote it through social media channels and through other avenues um, that the library's communications department helped us with, um, such as news releases and things like that, um, as well as university communications. If we wanted to just kind of see what happened in a little bit more of a passive way to say, can we get this information out in a number of different um, avenues? And then let's see where this goes. Um, I think that moving forward, that is that's more of like our thinking is how can we um, reach out to specific units or specific communities on campus um, and what is that going to look like. Uh, I would say our oral history um, component of the project is a little bit more um, proactive and um, our head of oral history of the oral history program um, has done a really good job at reaching out to individuals um, that either he knows on campus or that we that are recommended to us or that we may read about in a news release or something like that. Um, but again, that's it's pretty slow going and we hope to reach out to other groups such as UW Medicine, I mean medicine. So we'll see how that goes um, when we get around to that. Great. Uh, to those who didn't address copyright, could you expand on how you handled copyright ownership for the collections? For one, no, I didn't address that. And that was partly I dropped that ball um, to talk about that in the presentation. So um, what we did for the COVID stories project was very similar to what um, uh, Jessica and her group did um, at Uni University of Illinois, that um, we had a form that uh, folks could submit when they were um, getting wanting to participate in it. It's, as part of that form, they could mark if they wanted to do uh, sign copyright to ISU. Um, keep the copyright themselves or have a Creative Commons license um, uh, given to their materials um, for that purpose. So in that regard, that's how we handled um, oral histories and things like that as part of the um, uh, uh, COVID stories. The journals that were done through English, um, the English professors had reached out to us as well about regarding that um, toward the end of the semester of that project um, with the intention to send materials there. And we work with them to figure, uh, essentially have a paper form as well for that to see how people wanted to handle that if they wanted to um, assign copyright to the university, retain copyright, and uh, or a Creative Commons license to their materials as well. Um, is how we handled those. And again, very similar to the the voices um, of a pandemic was again that those aspects of allowing them to assign copyright, keep copyright, or have a Creative Commons license um, for the materials that would come to the archive. So um, we gave them a few different options on how to handle those type of materials. So um, I hope that kind of gives you an idea with what we did. Sorry for not addressing that earlier. Great, thank you all. Um, we are at time, so unfortunately we have to end this session, but thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thanks for attending. 
Thanks all for attending. Yes, thank you. Thank you.